Hi, um, and welcome to our Facebook Live about Parkinson's and mental health. Um, my name is Laura Cochrane and I lead the policy and campaigns team at Parkinson's UK. Um, today we're joined by Professor Richard Brown. Um, hi, Richard. Um, so, Richard, can you tell me uh, what your kind of background and your work in, in Parkinson's is? Yes, yeah, thanks, Laura. Yeah, so I'm a clinical psychologist by training. Um, I've worked both in my clinical work, but also in research settings in the field of Parkinson's for most of my working life. Um, so I'm based at King's College London, which is a university in uh, South London, which is very much around, works around the area of mental health and psychiatry and psychology. And for my clinical work, I work in the Morsley Hospital, uh, which is next door and just across the road from King's College Hospital, um, where many, many people with Parkinson's go. It's one of the regional centres. So my research and my clinical work are very much linked together. And in recent years, it's really been focused on areas of depression and anxiety, sort of pulling together both the clinical application, but also the research as well, much of which has been funded by Parkinson's UK. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, so we've got lots of questions that we, we've had in over the past couple of days um, around managing uh, people's mental health with their Parkinson's, which is obviously a, a big concern for people at, at this moment um, in, in time when people are, are kind of home and, and um, either self-isolating. Um, or, or socially distancing. So um, if, if we're okay, Richard, to, to start with the first mm -hmm. question, um, I'm finding the constant news and social media really overwhelming and quite frightening, but I think I need to keep up to date with what's going on. What should I do? Yes, yeah, so that's a really important question. It's one I think that we hear echoed a lot, both in people we talk to, but also people, you know, commenting on the radio and television about just that problem. And it's a real difficult balance, I think, for people to manage this wanting to be updated and informed, but on the same time, not being exposed all the time to, to the news, which is frankly the moment frightening and unpleasant. I think it's quite good to think about anxiety and what it is and why we feel anxious and one of the big drivers of anxiety is uncertainty and that if we're in challenging and uncertain times we look to find ways to relieve that uncertainty to get facts get information and knowledge and that's great if the information we get answers our questions but at the moment we're in the situation where no one's got the answers. Um, everyone's saying, we don't know how long it's gonna go on for. Uh, we don't know, sadly, how many people are gonna die, but the only information coming out is that it's gonna get worse before it gets better. And every time we tune in, we get that same information. So on the one hand, we're not getting our questions answered. We're not being reassured. And we're also exposing ourselves to frightening news. So. I think at this point in time, it's for all of us, if we can, and it's not easy, is to try to step back and to ration our exposure to, to news, not just factual news, but also social media and other channels where everyone is talking about it, sometimes helpfully, but other times, frankly, unhelpfully. And there's information which is frankly misleading or inaccurate. So what do we do? Um, one thing probably we shouldn't do is just try and cut ourselves off from the rest of the world. You know, we already are socially isolating and we don't want to isolate completely by being on our own little bubble because that's not healthy either. So I think what I'd recommend and what we see a lot of recommendations around is that we set ourselves maybe two or three times a day when we check in with the news on an outlet that we trust, whether it's um, radio, whether it's television, uh, or whether it's particular social media channels which we think offer good sound advice to us all, but not to constantly be trawling um, the internet or, or radio channels for updates. So maybe two or three times a day I think would be 
my suggestion as what I try to do myself. It's hard because you've got your smartphones and your tablets and things, and it's always there on demand. So it takes that bit of dis discipline, I, say, I suppose, to uh, try and resist that temptation to, to not go online. One Thank of the things, Rick. can I just say one, one more brief point? And again, it's something which I'm trying to put into practice myself is that the news for me typically in my routine would have been to watch the news before going to bed, maybe at sort of 10 o'clock. Uh, to be honest, that's the worst possible time to be listening to 20 minutes, half an hour of frankly frightening and bad news. The six o'clock news, whether it's on the BBC or wherever, the early evening news is identical. There's no new information being put out at 10 o'clock. So changing habits may be listening to the early evening news and then stopping the late news is a good way for us all to you know, de-stress and take these things off our mind in those crucial hours before we go to bed. Thank you for that, Richard. I was actually going to ask you, um, you know, what do you think are kind of the optimum times of, of day to, to check in with news? And, and you know, you, you answered that before I even needed to, to ask it. So, so your 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 kind of tip size to, to limit the the intake of news um uh you know through throughout the day and to, to maybe two or three times but really to, to do that before you're going to certainly at several hours before you go to bed so that you try reduce that, that anxiety. Um, I think it's also worthwhile remembering that there's quite a lot of useful information on um, the Parkinson's UK website. Um, Absolutely. Trying to put together all of the, the, the relevant information that's coming out from the government and make sure that any advice that is specific to Parkinson's is, is on the, the website. So that's parkinsons.org.uk. Um, there are also lots of other charities like Mind um, who, who have information on their website as well. Um, okay, fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Just sort of, just, just to carry on, because obviously we're talking about ourselves and what we can do, but for those people who are living in family situations with others, um, it sort of needs to be a sort of joint decision from everyone, because there's no point saying, well, I'm not going to have the television on if someone that you're living with insists on having it on all the time. So this is a subject an area which I think is good for everyone and it may need a little bit of negotiation to settle into a sort of a new way of, of consuming news that's that everyone can uh, accept and is, is for everyone's best interest. Yeah, absolutely. And, and lots of people um, I know from, from the, um, the, the Q&A that we did uh, had mentioned that there are more people in the house than, than it is, is usual at the moment. So I think that's a really good, really good point, Richard, to, 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 to kind of mention. Um, so uh, one of uh, the people, uh, one of our, 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 our members or our, our supporters asked, what can I do to keep my mind active and busy during this time? I'm usually working, but currently I'm not able to. Yeah. So the world and our lives are turned upside down at the moment for virtually everyone. Um, and certainly if work has been part of a person's life, the opportunity to work from home may be possible, but for many people it just can't happen or if they are trying to work from home there's just too many distractions going on around whether it's distractions from the news as we've talked about or just distractions in fact there's other people going about day-to-day -day life within the home so being able to work and work productively I think for many people is is a luxury um, most of us we have lost that normal routine of work there will always be, I suppose, rather than work as a, as a job, um, for many people work is something they do as an occupation and something to keep them active and engaged. It really is a matter of finding other things that can in some ways substitute. Um, it's not always easy and it's not always like for like substitution, but it's a sense really of thinking what work offers to us. And for many people, it is a routine. It is a sense that you do your work at certain days or certain times of the day. And when that's taken away, it creates a void which feels empty. And it's over time, it's starting to, to fill that out with other things which are occupying physically and mentally and socially. Person's not working, but they are 
they're getting the benefit from the sorts of things that work did occupy, uh, that did offer them otherwise. I think people want to be busy. Many people want to be, feel as if they're doing something useful. That's great, but it may in some ways be a bit of a luxury uh, at the moment. And it's probably more important to think about how, how we can fill our time both with productive and useful things, but also giving ourselves the time to, to relax, to do things perhaps that we didn't allow ourselves to do before, whether it's hobbies and pastimes, catching up with clearing out that cupboard that we've been meaning to do for months and years and sorting things out ready for that great day when we can all go off to the charity shop and, and hand in all those books that we've either read or, or never read. So there's, there's things that we can do which keep us busy, keep us occupied, make us feel we're doing something useful, and at the same time provide a wonderful distraction from the inevitable uh, things that are going on around us at the moment. Thanks for that, Richard. I, th I think that's, that's really good that there's a good mix there of, of things like puzzles and word searches, but also there's some, some, some other kind of fun things that you could potentially do as well as the more mundane things that we should all be doing, like clear our, our, our kind of our, our spare rooms or, or, or the things under the bed and our wardrobes out. Um, I guess one of the other things that, that, that people might want to, to be thinking about is, is maybe using some apps and, and, and gadgets um, to, to maybe think about how they can um, keep their symptoms uh, in, in check. So um, things like apps for helping with sleep or with improving speech or things um, that could maybe improve your, your well-being or even help with um, your, your anxiety levels. Um, and we've got a number of those kind of apps and gadgets um, uh, and devices um, listed on on our website so parkinsons.org.uk and um, and that may be again another way of being able to to kind of manage some of your symptoms while you're um while, while you are at home absolutely one thing we're not short of at the moment is time uh, many of us have more time than we know what to do with which is why i think people are feeling bored and and somewhat uh, adrift so there's all these good things that we sort of know that we should have been doing to help ourselves both mentally and physically and that really is a perfect opportunity to you know, to remind ourselves of that and to actually do them and build them into our day even 10 15 minutes spent doing a speech exercise or uh, a bit of bit of light physio or, or, or stretching exercises keeps us busy keeps us well and we feel that we've done something useful with it with that time rather than maybe just sort of sitting feeling bored or, or with a mind full of worries okay th th thanks for that richard um so another question in from uh, our community um, I struggle with anxiety, usually anyway, but finding the current crisis even more difficult. Do you have recommendations on what I can do to help manage my anxiety? Yeah, so if, if everyone's feeling anxious and stressed at the moment, it's even more so for people who already have a tendency to, to anxiety and worry um, at other times. Everything is just getting ramped up. Um, I mean, some of the things we've already mentioned should help. Certainly the keeping some boundaries around the access to news and um, unhelpful social media will provide some sort of cushion from um, that anxiety building up throughout the day. And as well, having a routine, keeping occupied, partly because it's distracting, but also um, it, it, it is positive in its own right. And will be, I think, perhaps as a question later on around physical activity, physical exercise, again, really good way to help manage anxiety. Perhaps more specifically though, I suppose one of the main features of anxiety for all of us, and particularly um, research suggests people with Parkinson's, is worry. Um, worry is something we all do. We worry when we have uncertainty. We worry when there's things which feel outside of our control. And some people worry more than others. And somehow worry feels almost inevitable. And however much you try and stop doing it, push it away, it will always come back. Um, but there are some 
quite effective and simple ways that we can all use to get a, get a handle, get a control of our worry, at least to some degree. And that's particularly important, I think, for people that have pre-existing anxiety. And one thing we can't say is, I must just stop worrying. It just doesn't work. You know, it's like saying, I'm going to try not to think of an elephant and pop up the elephant comes in your mind. So worry is there, and we, I suppose, have to accept that. And it's really to say, I'm not going to worry at all, is an impossible task, and we're just going to feel uh, hopeless about it. One thing we can do, and this has been shown to be very effective, is to limit our worry time to certain times a day, in the same way as we're limiting our exposure to the news. How can we do that? Well, we have to learn to do it. It's a skill, but it's one which we can acquire. Is that when we find ourselves worrying, and often it's crept up on us, and we haven't realized we were doing it until um, it actually starts to really come to the forefront of our mind, is at that point to try to stop and just to make a note of the thing that we're worrying about. Just a short comment, a simple sentence. And then to put that pad of paper away and to say, I'm going to come back to that worry later on. So we're postponing the worry rather than trying to stop it. And we can set ourselves maybe two times of the day, which we say is our worry time. Whatever we're doing, that is the time we have to sit, close our eyes and deliberately worry about these things that we had set ourselves to do. Now, it may seem perverse to actually deliberately try and worry, but what we find is that when people sit there and try to worry, they actually find it quite hard. Um, it's, it's almost saying, I tried it, I managed it for five minutes, but I just couldn't keep it going because it was so tiring. Uh, and people find their worry is sort of drifting away a bit. So it gives you a little bit of control over the worry. You're not trying to stop it. You're saying, I'm recognized as a concern. I made a note of it. I'm going to come back to it later, and I'm going to give it my full attention at that point in time. When to have as your worry time, it's, it's up to you. But often what I find for myself, and I know other people, is that worries often bubble up when we're trying to get to sleep or even when we wake in the middle of the night. And just making a note of those worries at that point in time allows us to say in the morning, if we say, well, when I wake up, once I've got myself going, washed and dressed and breakfast, I'm going to have my 10 minutes of worry time then. So you know you're going to come to it in the morning when the time is right. And then maybe another time, maybe mid-afternoon. And that is it. Trying as much as you can to ration your worrying to those periods of time. It may sound bonkers. Uh, it is slightly strangely it does seem to work and even if it takes the edge off the worries at other times brings it down you know five ten even fifteen percent that can make a big big difference and allows people as well to spend time doing other things um, that aren't worry because worry is all consuming when we're worried we're not doing these other things which we know are so good for us thank thanks for that Richard. That's, that's really that's really interesting to, to try and put some time aside each day actually um, accept your worry and, and then think of ways that you can um, almost kind of rationalize it. Mm, yeah um, and also so to say with worry um, a lot, lot of worries are based around sort of what ifs and things for which there is no answer so if we can try and sort of reframe our worries into something which has maybe a bit of a solution so if we're really worried about the health or well-being of, of a loved one someone who we're not seeing, um, then not just worrying about them, but thinking, well, what can I do? Well, in the morning, I will pick up the phone and I'll give them a ring and I'll have a check in. So thinking of how you can find, if not a solution, something practical that you can do, which is linked to that worry. Because again, that makes you feel, makes us all feel uh, better. There's some good, um, plenty of internet resources about worry management and I think there's a couple on the Parkinson's UK anxiety um, fact sheets as well that uh, uh, points, points in the right direction. Fantastic thank you for that Richard and, and just to say that um the, that the resources around anxiety um, and, and depression have been uh, um, packaged up and put in with our coronavirus information on the Parkinson's U UK website so when you go on to, to the homepage, um, parkinsons.com 
okay um, you'll you'll see the um, the information and resources there um, so, so moving on to another question that we've had in from, from our community, I'm finding the current crisis is making my OCD worse. So that's obsessive compulsive disorder worse. Why is that and what can I do? Okay, yeah. So uh, OCD is another form of anxiety disorder, not so much linked to worry, um, which is perhaps the more, more common form. But in OCD, people cope with their heightened levels of anxiety by often going through certain rituals like hand washing or, or checking because it makes them feel better in the short term but then the anxiety bubbles up again so um, it's not surprising therefore that these these responses that people with OCD have to try to control their anxiety are really bubbling up at this time um, most people who recognize and identify themselves as having OCD, many will have sought help in the past, maybe um, seen psychologists and had uh, cognitive behavior therapy. If that is the case, even if it was some years ago, think about what helped you at the time. What were the things that you learned to do or the strategies that you uh, were given which were helpful? Very often, we're human and we stop doing the things which are good for us and we often forget what works. So maybe just, just going back and refreshing um, your own experience on the things which have helped you in the past and seeing if you can put those into practice now. One of the, I suppose, the main sort of threats at the moment for people with OCD are those for whom hand washing has been um, part of their part of their problem. And of course, we're all being told to wash our hands a lot. So it's not surprising that someone with OCD and hand washing is just going to do it more and more and more. Sadly, for some people to the point that that's the main thing they do all day, which is which is terribly, terribly um, disabling and distressing. So like for all of us, whether we have OCD or not, hand washing is really, really important. But that doesn't mean to say we need to wash our hands repeatedly throughout the day if we haven't come into contact with other people who may have um, a, a cough or uh, other signs of illness, or if we haven't sort of we're not unpacking shopping from outside. You know, just to limit our hand washing to those times when we feel we have had an actual real sort of exposure to something where we just want to take a precaution, but not at other times. If you find yourself washing your hands just because you're anxious and the washing takes the anxiety away, that is much more of an OCD type problem. Okay, thank, thank you for that, Richard. Um, so one of the things that you've mentioned in, in some of the questions already is around staying active. Mm. So questions from, from our community is, would you recommend medication or exercise for stress um, and if exercise what type? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to distinguish between stress and anxiety. Now they can feel the same in that you know we they lead to physical tension and and we feel our mood changes and we feel irritable and, and under pressure um, but they are they are different. Um, for stress I certainly wouldn't recommend medication to reduce stress. Um, in terms of anxiety, then if a person is already taking medication for anxiety, they should certainly um, they should certainly continue with that. And if they did feel that their anxiety is getting significantly worse and they can't control it in other ways, then they should get in contact with their healthcare professional to see if they can arrange a telephone consultation to look at their prescription. But for most of the time, both stress and anxiety can be well managed by the things that we do and also the things we don't do. So we stop doing some things which are unhelpful, like the constant checking online, and we do more of the positive things, um, managing our worries, being occupied, keeping routines, and taking physical exercise as well. So in answer to the question, no to medication, I would suggest, as a way of managing stress, yes to exercise as part of a, a broad menu of, of things to do with our day. In terms of what type of exercise, I wouldn't be prescriptive. Um, all people have different types of physical activity that they enjoy doing, um, and those are the ones they're more likely to carry on with. 
but also we just got to recognize uh, the physical limitations of many people with Parkinson's who, who can't go running, can't ride a bike. Um, some people you know, can't walk more than a few meters, but there's always something physical that a person can do, whether it's standing or sitting in their chair, something which keeps a part of their body going, gets the heart beating a bit more, gets the blood rushing through. Even for five minutes, it's an invaluable way of doing something positive and constructive um, as part of the day. People who have an exercise routine and for whom that is now not possible, that may just be you know, a long walk with the dog. Um, if a person's self-isolating, then it's finding alternatives within the home, things that they can do, which keep them physically active um, and provide some of that exercise opportunity. There's huge amounts of stuff on the internet now. YouTube and other platforms are full of exercise classes. Um, some are really for gym fanatics others of people maybe who haven't done much exercise at all in the past but there's there is something for everyone and i really would sort of recommend we all sort of do a bit of homework find things which maybe other people recommend and find useful and just try them out and if they're not for us fine find something else the last point though is the other side of being physically active is trying to avoid having too much time when we are really doing absolutely nothing. And by that I mean really just sitting in our chairs. Um, we may be reading, we may be watching the television, that's fine, but real physical inactivity is, is very unhelpful, uh, however much physical stuff we are doing. So long periods of time when we are doing nothing are to be avoided. With Parkinson's, obviously, there'll be periods of time when a person physically can't get out of the chair, and that's, you know, that's understandable. But when we are able, it's just making sure we take the opportunities just to stand up, to walk around, to make a cup of tea, to do anything, just to make sure that we have these periods of time throughout our day when we are just mobile, even if we're not doing exercise. Thanks for that, Richard. And um, as, as you, you know, um, Parkinson's UK have been doing quite a lot of work around exercise and physical activity and, and, and trying to, to um, give people with the condition uh, information and advice on <clears throat> the best forms of, of activity because you're, you're quite right. The, um, the, the, the differences in, in everybody's ability to, to, to kind of get take part in, in physical activity is different and so actually because of the the, the work that has been happening um, around trying to keep people with Parkinson's connected and stay active and well um, we've been working with um, some Parkinson's physios to rapidly put together some tips and um, advice on on physical exercise um, I'm sorry physical activity when people are, are at home because of obviously the, the, the self-isolation so all of that information again is on our, our Parkinson's website parkinsons.uk um, and we also have some online um, classes that will be starting I believe from from next week the, the 6th of, of April um, and you can find all of that information what classes the times um, on online um, but yeah do do check out our website because um, I think that's really important as Richard says to kind of keep um, active and, 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 and keep your, your mind um, going as, as well um, Another question that we've had in is uh, um, I, from, from somebody who has Parkinson's, they live alone um, and they're finding the self-isolation really difficult. They're feeling really lonely. What, what yeah. they do? Yes, yeah. Um, loneliness is a, a real concern at this time. I mean, it's, it's concern all the time for many people who do find themselves cut off um, for whatever reason from um, social contact with, with other people. And we know that even in the short term, loneliness is, lowers our mood, makes us feel unhappy. Longer term, it becomes more of a concern and can have quite significant effects on our physical and mental health. So it really is something that I think we all need to be paying 
careful attention to, both in terms of ourselves, but also other people that we know who may themselves be feeling lonely and isolated. I suppose one important point is that being alone isn't the same as feeling lonely, and that a person, some people are alone, but actually they cope remarkably well um they you know they, they they feel they're getting maybe the social contact with other people um that they need or as much as they need but for others it's quite intense uh, especially if they're the sort of people that are very used to lots of close face-to-face -face contact whether it's with neighbors whether it's uh, the postman or you know people in the local um local shop going to church groups or, or whatever it may be. So it's that sudden loss of opportunity to have close proximal contact with other people that really makes people realize how alone they are and how alone they feel. A bit like the exercise, it's a bit like the work, it's finding other ways to substitute that direct physical contact with other forms of social interaction. And at the moment, for most of us, that is, that is virtual. That is by phone. Um, that is by, um, if you have the means or the technology or the, uh, is to use FaceTime or, or other uh, messaging apps where you can not just talk to someone, but you can see them. And with the wonders of the internet now, there's no reason why we can't be having that regular contact with other people. Um, if we wait for them to contact us, then we may find that we're waiting a long time because uh, everyone's busy and preoccupied themselves. So sometimes we have to maybe break the, our own habits and actually be a little more um, outreaching and actually be the ones to initiate those contacts. The other point I think that's come out now from the the recent situation is just how many people there are out there in our local communities who are wanting to offer help and support to others and particularly people who are living on their own. People who have been very self-sufficient and maybe a little bit a little bit shy in themselves, maybe reluctant in the past to you know to talk to strangers or to accept you know help or, or input from a person they don't know. Um, now perhaps it's the time to just revisit those views we have and to think about what are the opportunities locally. Now I, I don't know what it's like where everyone else lives but where I live in the, in the city um, I must have had probably nine or ten flyers and leaflets put through the door just from well-meaning neighbours, um, people in the local area setting up um, community groups and volunteer groups who will do everything from drop off a pint of milk to actually um, giving someone a phone call if that's what they want. It's not forced on anyone but it's an opportunity which is there but it takes us to pick up the phone and contact this stranger and say hello I live at number 32, I got your leaflet, that's really nice, it'd be really helpful just to have a chat now and again. So I think we, we have to if we're going to do the right things for ourselves, we sometimes have to change our own habits a bit and, and you know, do things which are right for us, even if they're difficult at first. Thank you, Rich. So, so it's very much about uh, making sure that we keep in contact with people that we are in, in that. Um, it's worth saying that, that obviously Parkinson's UK um, does have a forum for people that are online um, and want to share their, their, their um, experiences and maybe get support from other people from the community. Um, and that's obviously, um, you know, live and, and people are speaking on that 24 hours a day. Um, we've also set up a new Facebook group um, that and in just a short um, space of time has over a thousand uh, people um, supporting each other through, through, through this. Um, we also have our helpline as well. Um, so if people are, um, you know, wanting some to, to talk about things because they are particularly concerned or that they've got some, some, some questions or queries about living with, with Parkinson's at this point in time, then don't hesitate to call our helpline. And, and the number is 0808 800 0303 
or alternatively you could email um, hello at parkinsons.org.uk if you have a query and, and, and people will, will be able to come back to you um, but yeah really good to, to, to kind of get that, that advice that um, you know we might have to step out of our comfort zone in order to keep those connections with others with others going um, okay, so the, the next question that, that we've had in from the community is um, around Parkinson's dementia. So somebody asked, is Parkinson's dementia likely to progress quicker if living on my own and being socially distant from my family, apart from obviously contact through phone calls? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yes, I mean for all of us being active and engaged and keeping ourselves busy is important for someone who's experiencing uh, dementia that's just as important and perhaps in some ways even more important that um, being having the lack of both physical and mental stimulation but also social stimulation can lead to people finding their some of their dementia symptoms getting worse now we all hope that this period of time is going to be over in a few months and then it can be back to business as usual so i wouldn't say over that period of time that someone with uh, dementia is going to suffer permanent increased progression but they may find that their their memory their attention is not as good as it has been um, anything that they can do to um, to keep themselves active and engaged and busy and occupied as we've already talked about is just as applicable to someone with dementia Family members may need to step up the social contact a little bit more um, if they're aware of the importance of preventing social isolation in someone who also has um, some cognitive problems as well. Um, I wouldn't worry that the dementia is going to get worse longer term. I think we don't want to add those worries onto all of the others. Um, do what you can while you can um, and really look forward to the period of time when we can get back to some degree of business as usual in the same levels of mental physical and social stimulation that uh, we all need for our well-being especially people who, who have parkinson's dementia thank thank you for, for that richard um so it's the next question that we've had in is i'm finding being in the house with my partner constantly is putting a strain on our relationship we usually get on but this situation is really intense what can we do okay so this is the opposite side of the coin to living on your own um, we're living in close proximity with other people often a, a spouse or partner but maybe with adult children as well um, or even potentially grandchildren the family units have now very different and we're living in close proximity in a confined space and um, the opportunities that we have to distance ourselves from each other and go out for walks or do things differently are inevitably going to put strains and tensions on any relationship whether between a couple or whether within a whole family so i suppose the first thing to say is just to normalize that it's to be expected it's not a sign that there's anything wrong with the relationship especially as as this um, person writing in has said that they normally get on well so this is this is a temporary solution uh, a temporary problem but it's one that you don't just have to live with um, good communication is usually the key to maintaining good relationships within um, difficult times and part of that is just accepting to each other that there will be times when I get ratty, when I get irritable and I lose my temper and I snap. It doesn't mean anything, it's just the situation we're in at the moment. And you can almost apologize before you do it. The other point is trying to avoid the blame game, you know, that I'm irritable because you're doing or not doing something else. Because to be honest, we're all doing things out of the usual. We're all tending to get on each other's nerves. Um, so just this frankness and openness and acceptance of the fact that there's these periods of times when we, we do lose it a little bit and we get on each other's nerves goes a long way to making it seem less significant. Doing things together, jointly together, is really good, whether it's a jigsaw puzzle, whether it's a 
watching a TV program you enjoy together, maybe sharing the same sofa rather than sitting in your own armchairs, just to try and have these periods of time where you actually have some positive interactions with each other, especially if there's been a bit of time when you've been a bit narky or, or niggly, um, just to, you know, if you want to rebuild that bond. But also just accepting the fact you probably do need periods of time when you are not in the same room together. So if you're lucky enough to have a home which has enough rooms that you can actually escape to, or maybe have one room which is your little haven, which you can go to, uh, separate from your partner, and just have a bit of personal time and personal space, that does no harm at all. Um, especially if maybe part of your daily routine is doing a hobby or a pastime, making sure that unless it's something you both enjoy that you you have some personal space and time for that and then you come together for your meals your lunch time or, or whatever it may be so really important to uh make the most of your time together but also make the most of your time apart in, mm -hmm. in the house um or, or, or kind of your home at this point i guess like board games um, are, are quite good to, to keep you kind of occupied as, as well um, obviously if you're not too competitive um, and, and other things that people have been sharing on kind of our forum and, and other the um, things um, you know being able to share memories and, and, and mm -hmm photos for instance even um having a, a little dance or 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 a disco or something in your kitchen um so that you're you're, you're kind of getting up and being active and moving around but also dancing and, and maybe reminiscing and remembering some of the times that you've maybe been on holiday or had a particularly kind of good night out so um yeah there's, there's there's lots of information again um on on our website um we've got a a good book um good information booklet as well that you can um you can read around sex and relationships that has some some of the tips that richard kind of talked about as well as some advice from um relate marriage counselors as as well because as richard says we're in a very intense period of time where people are spending lots of time um in each other's company so so moving on to, to the next question, Richard, um, this has come from a carer of someone with Parkinson's. They're finding um, that they're usually the, the positive one, they keep upbeat, um, but at the moment they're finding it very difficult um, because they're concerned and scared, but they want to stay positive for, for their partner. What's, what's your advice on, on, on being able to kind of find that balance? Mm, yeah. Um. It's a hard one because we want to, you know, protect those that we love and care for. And part of doing that is how we come across as being positive and optimistic and so on. But it's a tough one. You, I, I think you've just got to allow yourself the recognition that you can't do it all the time. It's, it, it's, it's just impossible. Um, so by all means, keep positive when you can but not to feel that you are obliged to do so i suspect that the things that you're trying to protect your relative from by being positive they are very aware of themselves um, they may not be talking about it in the same way um, but it's probably not a not a secret so sometimes just recognizing the fact that the other person does have worries that you share um, sometimes you can just talk about them without always being positive especially if you can find possible solutions to help worry manage those concerns so the sorts of things we've already talked about um, rather than being positive it's saying as if nothing's wrong or it's all going to get better, it's all going to be fine in the future, uh, is to say, well, this is difficult times, what can we do? What can we do that's positive rather than just necessarily having a positive attitude? So any of the, any of the advice, any of the suggestions, any of the tools which um, we've been covering here, ones that can form the basis of a conversation with the person we're caring for because you're helping them but you're also helping yourself you're doing something for them and not just trying to put a uh, put a gloss on your own feelings thank thanks for that richard and i guess the the other things that that 
you know people can um, focus on is 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 or carers can can focus on is making sure they're still keeping connected with the outside world and other people as, as well so whether that's um, friends or relatives to make sure that they're getting the support that they need um, as as well and and you know again we, we have our helpline um, so so don't hesitate to, to call our, our helpline and the number again is 0808 800 0303. Um, some of the tips that other carers have shared with us is around keeping a, a diary and you mentioned it earlier on um, in terms of worry and writing your thoughts down but maybe keeping a diary and, and putting some of your thoughts and your, your feelings and your anxiety into there um, which maybe you can revisit kind of a, a later date. Um, and we've also got, as I say, information um, uh, about caring for somebody with Parkinson's on our website. So don't hesitate to, to kind of um, pop on there and, and, and find, um, find that information um, on the information and support section of, of our website. Um, the, the next question that we've got is, is actually around depression. And um, the, the member of the community shared that they've suffered from depression, depression in the past. And they feel that they're slipping back into this at the moment. Um, they've asked what they can do to pre prevent them from going back down that, that path. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's really important that the person has recognised that they're in this early stages, perhaps, of um, going back into depression that they've experienced before. Um, and it's always worth acting sooner rather than later. A, a bit like the earlier question about someone who has been anxious in the past and what they can do. It's really exactly the same here, I think, that for that person who has been depressed, to think about what's helped them previously, either in terms of formal therapy or things that they've done to, for themselves in terms of um, self-care that have helped bring them out of, of that depression. What are the things which work for them? And to check, check in on themselves that they're actually doing those things now, and if not, whether they can, um, can restart. To be honest, all of the things we've spoken about, you know, the routines, the positive activities, the exercise, the social contact, they're the single best way of helping our own mood to both keep our mood up, but also to try to counter the times when we feel it's starting to slip. So perhaps to put away the thought that, you know, it's, is it depression, is it anxiety? Often it's a mixture of the two, but the same forms of very sort of accessible, common sense self-management approaches that work for anxiety, work for depression. They work for people, even if they're not depressed or anxious, they just help us to feel better and to manage these difficult times. Thank you for, for, for that. Um... Richard, I, I think it's it's something that um, you're, you're right. It's great that somebody has recognised uh, that they could be slipping into to those um, those feelings, and, and taking action obviously is is, is really important. Um, worthwhile making sure that that, that you contact your, your you know your GP and. Mm. Um, recognize that um, you know GP surgeries at the moment uh, are um, experiencing some some um, extra pressures in terms of services but mental health is one of the things that is very much on the uppermost of of GPs um, GPs minds in trying to, to, to kind of manage um, and support their their community um, I know we, we, we've answered a question about social media beforehand, but I think it's, I think this one's quite a specific, um, specific one that we probably all suffer from at times. Um, so I'm finding social media difficult with lots of boastful pictures of long walks and great food. When a good day for me is getting to the shop without freezing, how can we stop this? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is another aspect of social media, which um, I think is often neglected. Um, and you use the word uh, boastful, and it's probably not meant in a boastful way, although there was a wonderful uh, story in the news about some multi-billionaire who tweeted himself isolating himself on his luxury yacht somewhere in the Caribbean, which I think made most of the world extremely angry. Um, 
and I think anger is the, the nub of this. I think what we do is we feel angry at the lack of consideration of other people who are making these posts, even if they're doing them not for malicious reasons. And I think we haven't seen too much of it, but I think there's a general sense along with us feeling maybe anxious and depressed is that we are also maybe at risk of feeling angry uh, at other people. Um, strangers often, so people on social media doing this sort of thing, people who don't socially distance in the local shop when we go out to buy some essentials. Um, there's very little often we can do to change other people's behaviour. Um, we feel angry, we feel as if we are justified in doing that, but anger isn't a very pleasant emotion to feel, especially if we feel it a lot. Um, so just recognizing ourselves that we're feeling angry and we are not actually doing anything to the person who's made us feel angry, we're just harming ourselves, can sometimes help us just say, well, they're not worth it. You know, I'm what's worth it. I don't really care what they're doing. Um, I really need to look after myself. In terms of exposing, you know, seeing these long posts of people on their long walks and eating great food, um, if we have the ability, if it's a particular social media platform or channel or chat that we're part of or Facebook group, um, I would just say just try to ration your access to it. And if it's really concerning you a lot of the time, just delete it and turn it off and find something else, find an, an alternative which um, makes you feel not just better, but perhaps less angry. Thank you for, for, for that, Richard. And, and I think um, <clears throat> you're right. There's definitely um, a, a lot of people that are trying to put positive messages out there um, um, on social media. And, and sometimes, you know, if we're having a bad day, it may not um, it may not land well with us. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think I think there's there's certainly something about um, muting or coming out of a particular group um, and for a period of time, but also at the same time making sure that you're doing something to um, boost your own mood. So whether it is exercise, whether it is um, doing something that, that you particularly enjoy, such as um, reading a book, um, going on online and listening to um, kind of radio, music, theatre, there's lots of lots of um, free things that, that people can um, people can can really enjoy that I think you know during the the, the outbreak um, uh, the National Theatre have got um, some, some live shows on a Thursday night. I know that Sather's Wells is doing kind of other other um, other uh, live performances or, or kind of um, online performances. So, yeah, keeping keeping yourself busy and active and doing something you enjoy um, may may help to, to kind of take the the sting out of some of those those social media posts. Um, we've got one more question, um, but before we, we, we finish, um, the, the final one is um, around medication. So, um, are regular and quite severe mood swings likely to be linked to medication regime? Could medication adjustments potentially help? Yes, well, I'm just bear in mind, I'm not a, a medical practitioner, so I wouldn't like to uh, advise. Uh, on whether or not medication adjustment is, is necessary and obviously for individual uh, individual people that's something which um, I would really strongly recommend they contact their um, Parkinson specialist about. Um, if this person describes mood swings which are both regular and quite severe then that is certainly something which um, I would strongly recommend they, they do uh, ask about and it could be that medication adjustment is called for but um, to take advice from uh, from their healthcare professional about that. Um, for other people I think there will be inevitable fluctuations throughout the day not just in terms of motor function but also in, in terms of um, mood whether it's depression or, or anxiety. That will probably be an inevitable part of the rhythm of people's days. There'll be times when they're feeling much better, much more positive, much more busy and occupied and positive about things, and others where things actually seem pretty, pretty, you know, um, flat or even quite 
troubles troubled at, at times. Um, that is inevitable. It doesn't mean to say it has to happen. Um, in the, it's recognizing these periods of time when maybe a person is more prone to feeling low. It could be because they feel very tired because uh, they've had a busy day or their Parkinson's has really caught up on them. Um, those times may be ones when a person may feel, find their mood starting to drop. And it's thinking of things that can be done even during those times when they're feeling tired um, that can provide some sort of respite um, from, um, from the, the, the risks of low mood. And it could just be the time that um, you, uh, you pick up the phone and talk to someone and just have a very brief and undemanding chat or, or even um, put on a piece of music, something which isn't going to be physically or mentally demanding but uh, to help help provide a bit of um, a bit of respite as I said from uh, those periods when the mood does start to dip. Okay thank you so much Richard for, for, for your time it's been great to get your, um, your tips um, and, and you know your perspectives on on all of the questions that we've had in um, to today. Um, it is worthwhile saying that, that um, if, if you are uh, having concerns or if you do have concerns about your, um, you know, any, anything to do with Parkinson's, um, whether it is mental health, mood, um, then don't hesitate to, to call our helpline. That's 0808. 800 0303. Um, we also have information on our website parkinsons.org.uk on anxiety, depression and the whole range of symptoms um, that people with Parkinson's live with. Um, we also have uh, the online forum where you can talk to, to other people with Parkinson's and carers and share advice and, and, and support um, each other. Um, and I also mentioned earlier on we have the, the Facebook, um, the new Facebook group, which you can find um, via our, our Facebook page. So again, do um, do do uh, join the group and, and share your 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 concerns, but also at the same time support other other people. Um, just really want to say thank you so much again, Richard, for, for your time, but also thank you everybody for for your questions um, because hopefully we you know we've answered the the queries that you've got and and you'll be able to um, to to uh, have a lots of exercise um, and physical activity um, enjoy the the time that you're spending with um, your, your friends and family and maybe in, in your house um, and stay connected but um, yeah just just really want to say thank you again for, for your time Richard and, and thank you all for, for the questions Bye. Bye.